Well, reliable sources tell me that, uh, that Bill Nye for the millennial generation is a, a major figure because of his program, Bill Nye, the science guy. I must say, I've never seen the program, but I guess for uh, 20-somethings and 30-somethings, Bill Nye was an important uh, figure. And I'll certainly take their word for it on, uh, on science. I guess he led young people through experiments and sort of taught them the basics of the scientific method. But I just saw him uh, on a uh, video talking about the relation between science and philosophy. And I can tell you that he might be the science guy, but he sure is not the philosophy guy. Um, in a kind of rambling uh, answer to a question about philosophy, he said, well, philosophy uh, never seems to deviate from uh, common sense. Philosophy uh, doubts uh, sense experience, and philosophers worry about things like whether we're part of an intergalactic uh, ping pong match. Well, I wasn't entirely clear what he meant, but, you know, with regard to the first one, um, heck, it, from Socrates on, it's almost a commonplace that philosophers do deviate from common sense. They say things that are surprising and, and so on and so forth. Doubting sense experience, well, people like, you know, Descartes and, and Hume did that, but really as part of a sort of epistemological experiment, not so much a claim that the, the sensible world is not real. It was more part of a uh, epistemological experiment. Uh, are we part of a uh, intergalactic ping pong match? Well, that to me sounds like more of a, an LSD trip than any serious philosopher I've ever read. Uh, my point is, I don't think he knows an awful lot about philosophy. And what undergirds his statement is something I've been concerned about for a long time, namely scientism. Scientism is, uh, to put it bluntly, a reduction of all knowledge to the scientific form of knowledge. Now, the problem is, the scientific form of knowledge has been massively successful, as we all know. Thank God. You know, it's developed in the late 16th, early 17th century. The scientific method, you know, that you empirically observe, you form hypotheses, you experiment to test hypotheses, and then you repeat experiments to confirm what you've determined. That method, simple, enough to state, but that method has had massive success all over the world, and its attendant technologies have, have crucially uh, improved human life. And so no one doubts the success and the beauty and legitimacy of the scientific method, but in some ways its very success is the, is the problem. It carries a shadow, namely a sort of epistemological imperialism. Science now is the only way that we can know reality. Watch um, Carl Sagan's Cosmos from the 1970s to see a, a, a full-blown version of this. But you sense it, too, in Bill Nye's kind of dismissal of a discipline he knows almost nothing about, clearly, philosophy, in the name of a sort of triumphant um, science. See, go back now to the very beginning of philosophy. Go back to Plato. Plato gives us the still compelling parable of the cave. You want to see that repeated, by the way. Look at the Matrix as a good example of it. Uh, the parable of the cave. Plato imagines people who are chained inside a cave. All they see are the flickering shadows on the wall. One of the uh, prisoners manages to escape, makes his way out of the cave, up into the higher world, and he sees, you know, the real three-dimensional things. And then he finally looks up to the sun, the very source of, of all light and knowledge. Okay. It's a beautiful metaphor, still powerful, as I say, for the advance beyond a merely empirical sort of science. The world that I can see, the world that I can measure, the world I can hypothesize about, now use 17th century language, or experiment upon that world. There's a transcendence of that world which is possible, a moving into a higher realm of the more intelligible and the more fully real, and finally an intellectual contemplation of the source of all knowledge and reality. See, Plato's uh, cave is a metaphor of this call it epistemological um, liberation from the merely empirical. Plato's successor and disciple, the great Aristotle, who always spoke in a little more prosaic manner than his master, um, expressed the idea in terms of the ascent of knowledge. So Aristotle knows about physics, the study of matter and motion, he would have known. Uh, that would correspond more or less to what we would know by the, the physical sciences. So Aristotle loved that and, and writes a whole book on physics. But beyond the physics, he first sees mathematics, the study of, of abstract forms and mathematical patterns, etc. But then beyond mathematics, 
is the metatafusika in his Greek, what's beyond the physics, beyond the measurable, empirically determinable world, the higher realm. And reason has a lot to say about the metaphysical realm. Read, if you doubt me, his great treatises on metaphysics, and then coming from Aristotle all the way up to Heidegger, read philosopher after philosopher, who does a rational examination of the metatafusika, what lies beyond the physics. Um, what we see in scientism, it seems to me, is a tremendous reduction and impoverishment of the idea of rationality. If we reduce rationality to what Aristotle would call the physics, we're forgetting enormous realms that can and should be explored by reason. Now, I'll make it a little more concrete. I love physics, you know, and the study of, of the world and experimental science, et cetera, et cetera. And physics might tell you a lot about, um, you know, the composition of matter and, and the composition of the, of the pages that make up a book, et cetera. But physics qua physics will never tell you a thing about the meaning of Melville's Moby Dick or of uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. It can, even in principle. Biology can tell you all about muscles and nerves and, and bodily uh, uh, patterns and so on and so forth, but it can't begin to tell you why a given act is moral or immoral. Astrophysics might even tell you about, you know, the singularity from which the Big Bang, you know, the Big Bang and from which the universe comes. But astrophysics, qua astrophysics, can't tell you a thing about the relationship between contingent being and non-contingent being. Or to put it in Heidegger's language, it can't tell you why there's something rather than nothing. There are higher forms of reason that lie beyond the merely scientific. And now, here's a more general issue, and Bill Nye brought it to my mind. The crisis of the humanities in our educational system, and you see it in university after university, where a lot of the humanities programs are, are struggling. Sciences, oh yeah, everyone gets that, you know, and and engineering and the practical application of the sciences. Everyone gets that. But the humanities, poetry and art and literature and philosophy are suffering. But this means what? It means that we are imprisoning ourselves now inside of Plato's cave. We're content to talk about the evanescent and passing physical world with great accuracy and with great utility but we are chaining ourselves in place so that we cannot get out of the cave and see the higher realms. So see, my worry, especially for the millennial generation that would look to someone like Bill Nye as a, as a model, that, that we're gonna get a generation that is just permanently stuck inside of Plato's cave.